So good morning, everybody, uh, or good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, we'll be getting started in just under one minute. So we'll just allow a few more people to join uh, as uh, as you do. Thank you so much for joining this session this morning or evening again, as wherever you want may be the centrality of green growth. So we'll go ahead and get started. So once again, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, next session at 9.45 uh, Hong Kong time on the centrality of green growth. My name is Michael Walsh, and I'm the CEO of the uh, Pacific Basin Economic Council, which is a quasi uh, think tank based in Hong Kong. And I'm delighted to be joined this morning by two fellow panelists in Camille Levy, the CEO of GE's steam power business in the Asia Pacific and China region, supporting utility and industry customers with building, operating, maintaining and improving their steam power plants. She has uh, a pretty important role in terms of looking after more than 2,500 staff in the region. And uh, also joining us this morning, which I'm delighted to all the way from Detroit, Michigan, is Bo Anderson, the president and CEO of Yatsi, Yatsi, Yatsaki, sorry, North and Central America, and President of Yatsaki Europe and Africa. He is responsible for more than 140,000 people across 28 countries and approximately 8 billion in revenue. So um, I, he's originally from Sweden um, and he joins us today. So I'm delighted, guys, to welcome both of you and uh, thanks for joining us. So the, the sort of topic that we're covering today is really around uh, the demand for energy companies in particular and supply chain companies to be looking at more of their sustainability footprint going forward. And I think uh, COVID has just sort of put the highlight or microscope on all that we do in many industries, whether it's uh, automotive, aviation, power. And it feels in some ways we've been guilted a little bit more into doing more quickly uh, for the planet in particular. But I wanted to talk about a little bit first to uh, Camille about renewable energy and waste management sectors. Obviously, you're in a sector that is could be uh, regarded as highly pollutant um, from those who aren't in the know. But we would like to sort of hear from you about what is uh, GE in particular um doing around the asia pacific region so if i could hand you the floor camille maybe just introduce yourself a little bit further about what's your day-to-day -day, and then talk a little bit about what developments and projects that's exciting you that you're seeing in the region that you're going to start telling us about thank you so much camille over to you thanks uh, thanks michael i'm very uh, very happy to be uh, to be here this morning at the uh Harassas meeting around and, and particularly in this panel about the centrality of green growth. Um, so as Michael was explaining, I run the Asia Pacific and China region for steam power. So in a nutshell, steam power is the business of General Electric that builds and maintains coal and nuclear power plants. And when we say coal and nuclear power plants, it really extends to uh, more to diversify energy sources, including oil and gas, but also more recently biomass and waste or energy. So it's, and, and the region, obviously, as most of you are aware, um, coal remains a very important share of the nuclear of the of the, the power generation mix. Nuclear is a bit, little bit smaller and focused in, in the key countries. Um, and our, our you know, my day to day job is really to make um, those plants run and continue um, continue to be provided the electricity supply that is required in the region. So if, if you're looking a little bit into the, the balance between um, what we call the traditional energy sources, which is largely fossil in this region versus renewables, we're seeing some really, really interesting dynamics 
Um, I'm, I'm originally from, from Europe. And when I came to Asia, I got a lot of comments of, of people telling me, but Kimi, this is, you know, when you're coming to Asia, the energy transition is much slower than what you've seen in, in countries like Germany or countries like California. And as I, you know, I've been, I've been in this region for three years and I really found it super interesting to see that in this region, the energy transition at the pace at which it's happening, it's not slow. It's really a deliberate pace to try to find the balance between three key factors. The first one, uh, and I think Michael was alluding to this in, in this introduction, is about the environment, making sure and that's very high on everyone's agenda. It's about driving climate change. It's about the highest population attention to making sure you have less polluting source of energy. The other second element, environment, second one being around affordability. When you talk Asia and you talk energy, you typically require 0.8% gross in electricity consumption for 1% percentage points of GDP growth. So if you're trying to grow those economies, you really need to make sure that it's going to be affordable because it will enable your your country to grow. And finally, the key topic is around reliability. If you're trying to develop your economy and make it clean, it needs to be reliable. So you need to ensure that you have electricity all the time. So when people are saying, hey, where are we between the balance of traditional energy sources versus renewables? The governments and the regions are really paying a lot of attention to balance between environment, affordability, and reliability. And that's where we will see in this region, and I'll be interested to hear everyone's thoughts on this, we will continue to see a significant share of fossil fuel because, yes, environment is extremely important, and you have technology which are available today to ensure that you can produce uh, electricity from coal with emissions which are very comparable to gas. You can capture up to 99.5% uh, with GE technologies, but with a, a lot of other technologies in the market, you can capture all of the traditional pollutants. Um, but today you will really see, you will continue to see a fair amount of renewable energy generation to enable, to support the reliability. I'll just give one example. Over the summer uh, in California, which if you think California, and I'm sure Bo is very familiar because he's in the he's based in the US. Uh, California is seen as a place where the transition to to you know green growth has been extremely, extremely rapid and extremely positive. However, over the summer, you've had a series of blackouts in California, uh, which were caused by combination of weather events, you had fires, you had extreme heat waves, so you had to get a lot of air conditioning. But the supply of electricity was coming mostly from renewables. Unfortunately, when you have a heat wave, typically that's when there's no wind. So as you were getting into the later hours of the day, wind started blowing, obviously you have no sun because it's starting to be dark. And that's when you had to have Rolling blackouts, you see rolling blackouts in the countries of the Googles and Facebook. Yes, but that's the reality of the balance that you need to strike if you don't think about the reliability of your power generation. So I'm super excited in this region because I'm really seeing a deliberate pace for the energy transition. A lot of countries moving to biomass, talking about the Philippines, G is building a new biomass plant in, in Japan. So really exciting about the pace, but really government's tr trying to strike the right the right balance. Fantastic. Now, I agree with uh, a lot of what you've just mentioned about, especially about reliability. Sometimes there is this uh, over excitement, if you over exuberance, if you like, to moving to renewables um, and not necessarily then re keeping the backup in place um, for those for those in California in particular. But but before we move uh, on, I don't know, Bo, do you have a comment at all about this area, uh, you know, in terms of fossil versus renewable? I know it's not necessarily your day job, but do you have a comment to make on that? Yeah, I would say that for us in automotive, China is the largest market and, and China is moving very fast on electrical vehicles. And, and why? I mean, first, they have no oil. Secondly, pollution is an issue. 
and, and third, they would like to have the word leadership in electrical vehicles. So I would say in China, I see the electrification coming very fast. Yeah. But obviously, they've set out some targets, like President Xi's come out recently with a 2060 target to be carbon neutral, but by 2030 to have peaked in their overall um, emissions. Uh, do you, I mean, coming back to you, Camille, do you see that you know, on the ground? Is that realistic, You know what they've set out as a plan? I know you can only speak for a sector of the industry of power, but are you seeing uh, his words empowering the country to get behind it? I think what we've seen in in in, um, in China, and I can obviously speak only for my uh, for, for for my own turf, which is uh, which is uh, steam power plants. What we've seen is, from a nuclear point of view, we've seen the I mean the the, the industry go at a, at an extremely fast pace in terms of adopting carbon free uh, power generation. Uh, it was interesting to see that Taishan, which is one of the latest uh, uh, third generation nuclear power plant, was the second power plant in the, in the world last year in terms of the size of electricity generation. So you've really seen in China uh, a very fast pace of adoption of newer and cleaner technologies. If you're looking within the past 15 years, China, which obviously has a very, very large coal base, has retired very quickly, um, a number of uh, old um, coal power plants. So if you're looking, um, a 1% point efficiency in your power plants will reduce CO2 emissions by 2%. So China said very deliberately, we're going to retire the older generation of coal plants and we're going to replace it by newer and more efficient power plant. And this has had a massive impact in terms of the traditional pollutants, but also in terms of CO2 emissions. So I think, again, with the the amount of, of intensity and rigor at which China is usually planning, at least in my sector, I've seen very bold moves in terms of how uh, mm. the, the utilities in China have, have endorsed um, trying to reduce the environmental impact of power generation. So I'm very, very confident in that in that regard. So thank you, Camille. And we're going to stick with China for a moment and, and turn to you, Bo, because we're going to look at and talk a little bit about, I guess, the perception of over reality. The perception has been during this COVID crisis, even before pre-COVID, that there was um, a movement or perceived movement of production coming out of China and potentially going into the ASEAN region or even to South America. Um, but in reality, very little is actually happening, isn't it, Bo? I mean, in, in fact, it's probably the opposite effect. There's actually more people investing into China as it's the largest market. Would you say that's is that a true statement in terms of the resilience part of supply chains that has been talked about on so many webinars, it feels like, the last few months? No, I, I agree with your statements. And um, this Friday, we were on a web seminar with one of our largest European customers, and they stressed the importance of localization in Brazil, Russia, India, and China. So I would say in automotive, I see much more focus on localization with all the benefits of localization for the the customer. Secondly, we have been in China for a long time, uh, we have been in Vietnam since 1995, and none of our customers have expressed any views of changing any footprint. Yeah. So, if if you know hypothetically, and you've been hearing a lot as I have, um, there isn't really a pla- a replacement for China today that can do you know that whole ecosystem that can provide the ecosystem of the supply chain um, at scale. Uh, is that? I mean, would you agree, Bo, on that? I mean, there's been talk about India, but India's not ready, right? No, I, I would say that in, India is not ready. If you take our North American operations, we, we have a lot of closed sourcing in Mexico, and, and Mexico has developed a lot during the last 20 years. But if you go back to automotive, the main growth will be in Asia. And yeah. that's where China is a perfect place to be. But uh, coming back to your own um, 
electric, I mean, electrical supplier in terms of the uh, products that you're, you're one of the largest electrical component suppliers to the auto industry. What have been some of the pinch points, if any, during this COVID crisis for you in the supply chain from an Asia perspective, or, or there hasn't been any problems at all? First, if I go back, I've been connected with Horatius for more than 10 years, and I thank Frank for his leadership to start mm. to do this over the Internet. Going back to your question, I would say the last 12 months have been challenging. Uh, we have a relatively large supply base in China, and we were pinpointing 1,900 part numbers that we had problems with starting already in December last year. Uh, secondly, we went into April, May with absolute no revenue and our inventory that is normally relatively lean became very high. And the last three months we see every customer is back to 100, 110 percent. And here we see that no shipping capacity is available and very few flights are available. Before, if we had challenges, we could hand carry and hand carry means that we have our own people flying as passengers and yeah. taking 20 kilos of 40 pounds. That's not possible anymore. So I would say it's a good stress test for our supply chain. So far we have fulfilled the test, but we have also learned new, many new tricks. And obviously we talked about it just before we went live. You, men you mentioned that you've in some ways um, had to look at a series of charters to offset some of this supply uh, pinch points going through to Christmas. Where does those costs, additional costs, get pushed to in in terms of the business? Does it get passed on to the end customer? Yes and no. Uh, I mean, first we we are Japanese premium supplier and we are one of the largest suppliers. Uh, we have 33% market share on gasoline and diesel vehicles. We have 50% market share on hybrids and 50% market share on full electric. What we have seen the last four months is our customers are building more premium products. If that's the case, that the mix is changing, we can charge for that. Got it. On if schedules go up plus 20% or minus 20%, that's inside the norm, but we say we need to eat that. So apart from China, Bo, what other countries are you, I mean, you mentioned Vietnam. Uh, you mentioned also to me offline that that is potentially uh, at the moment 100 percent export uh, market for you in terms of you're producing it in Vietnam, but it's for uh, customers outside of Vietnam. When do you think that there'll be a demand within places like Vietnam where you mentioned the localism effect? Do you see that starting to, to, to change the dynamics? I would say it's, it's maybe too early to, to say, but I, I see Vietnam is a good market for us. Uh, if I flip the gear and say that where we have been very challenged this year is Philippines. So Philippines were initially hurt by the COVID. And then we had a couple of typhoons and, and other things the last month. But Philippines is one of our major operations for Asia. Got it. So that comes back in some ways to the environmental question, you know, these events, certainly since I've been in Asia for the last sort of 13, 14 years, it feels like some years you get away with it. And then other years you see some really um, first of its kind weather events, like the like we're seeing in Australia now, the hottest days recorded in November since records began. Um, so I guess uh, it comes back to that. What can the private sector? So coming back to you, Camille, um, what role is the private sector playing to go some way to achieving the targets we mentioned earlier that are being set by different governments and by world organizations? And we have obviously uh, next year, the big climate meeting itself that has been postponed by one year in uh, COP 2020's move to 2021 in Glasgow. Um, is there any expectations as a, you know, as a company like GE, which is, I guess, uh, has its obligations, um, what do you see yourself, you know, what are the, I guess, the challenges for you to meet those goals? As you mentioned before, it's an affordability question, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it's GE, like, uh, uh, very clearly, we see yourself playing, a, a, you know, really a fronting role 
in um, in, in building a work a world that works, but very very clearly building um, a world because we provide um, infrastructures across many different different sectors, but building a world which will you know be be tackling in a very effective way of the challenges of, of, of climate change and by bringing into the market products that are um, higher and in terms of environmental standards. Coming to coming back to your question, I think the the one of the key roles that companies like like GE and others can play is by bringing technologies. But when you talk about bringing technologies, obviously GE is the world leader in and, and renewables, we uh, we just introduced in the market our latest generation of offshore, offshore wind turbines, which is above 12 megawatts with very high um, efficiency and reliability. But it's also, in my view, bringing technologies across the energy landscape, if we're talking energy. So making sure that the private sector continues to invest in the, in the install base. So if you're looking at a typical... Um, Utility scale power plant, it's a 600 megawatt or a thousand megawatt. And those are assets which are here to stay. So when you're building a power plant, it typically takes a couple of years to develop the projects, then a couple of years to build, typically three, four years. And then once the asset is up and running, it's going to be on the ground for 25 years. So if you're looking today, one of the major sources of, of, of CO2 is obviously the power generation sector. So the private sector is, in my view, a very, very strong role in addressing the install base. And, Michael, we were talking the other day about planes. Mm-hmm. But if you have a plane that starts running, that is getting delivered, going out of the factories from Airbus or, some, or any of the other competitors, it's going to be here to stay for the long term. So I think the private sector really, really has a role to play and look at what options are here to bring obviously CO2-free generation to bring latest advanced energy storage. And here, companies like GE are playing a forefront role because putting a lot of R&D and putting a lot of development money and bringing those you know, newest generation of products. But I also think comp- companies need to continue to invest to address the install base and make sure that on your asset, which is here, that you're going to bring it to best available technology level continue to do upgrades, maintain it the right way, because the, the majority of the uh, emission sources today comes from the install base. So when you're talking longer term, going to carbon neutrality, if you don't address the install base by bringing in technology, it will be very, very important. So technology for me is key from the private sector. The other topic being financing. As you see seeing today, we're seeing a huge move of public and private financing towards green growth, which is really great and which I think is a great um, is a great move in terms of putting the focus on things that really matter. But as you're looking into investments from the private sector in particular, moving towards green growth, I'm coming back to this topic of install base. If money is not coming to ensure that you will be addressing the install base, that you'll be addressing the, I mean, the more traditional way to to drive of mobility of power generation, you run a risk of two ways and not enough investments going to fund technologies that will enable to tackle emissions and environmental constraints where it's most effective. So I really think there's a role in terms of the private sector to really look from a financing perspective at what makes sense and to continue to invest in traditional energy sources to make them cleaner and to ensure that those cleaner technologies, which are available today, will come to the the market. I completely agree with you that this um, technology will and is already playing a a significant role um, in achieving some of these uh, targets. But it is a lot, in some ways, it's a long road ahead, though, right? I mean, you mentioned uh, in terms of you as a, as a supplier from a Japanese perspective, 33% are still using the traditional petrol diesel. Um, when do you think that that is going to morph into the other other 100% that you mentioned, 50% hybrid, 50% electric? What's the time horizon, Bo, do you see? And is, does it really, uh, does it 
Is it about where you are in the world as opposed to uh, anything else? Is it because of government regulation, mandatory, or is it uh, people choice? No, so first, maybe maybe I wasn't clear, uh, Michael, is that our market share is 33% of gasoline and, and diesel. Uh, yeah. Today, if you take it in North America or in US, the hybrid and electrical vehicles less than 5%. In Europe, in October, we had a record month with 27% of the vehicles being sold was hybrid and electrical. And I would say in China, they are around maybe 10, 15%. But I would make three remarks. First, Toyota is one of our largest customers. They did a very good thing because they opened up their patents on hybrid technology. So anyone can use their patents to get scale. Secondly, this Friday we had a web seminar with one of our largest European customers and he used an example where a mid-sized car in, in Europe today with gasoline engine is 14,000 euros. The same full electric is 30,000. And he challenged that if we as an industry don't get the scale and the cost down, the middle class will be out of buying a new car. And third, I think it's very important that governments helps to subsidize. But personally, I think it's wrong that government gives the companies that have no emission the money so they can sell it to the people that have a lot of emissions. That's my personal view. Well, I mean, I could comment as well and, and say it's exactly the same situation in aviation with the uh, introduction of SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuel, which is kind of that bridge, if you like. It's not the silver bullet, but it's certainly one of the available solutions today that can be scaled, that can uh, reduce the carbon output. But there's this significant gap in the pricing, at, like anything when you introduce it as a new product and you're competing with the mass product of the fossil fuel that's been around for uh, decades, it's very difficult without some support, whether it's tax credits or the like, which we've seen in California being adopted from the ground vehicle into the air vehicle, which has made California now the hottest place for SAF development in the world. Um, and obviously Europe as well, with its uh, the European Commission is also mandating um, some of this, and this allows also for SAF to be developed um, sustainably in a sustainable way uh, with the right financing structure to start to bring in enough, well, a little bit of the supply. We're still only talking less than 2% of global supply of uh, aviation fuel. But I think you're right, Bo, you, you talk about it needs to be targeted because otherwise the money will go to the wrong people in the wrong hands. And it, in some ways, it delays what we're trying to achieve in the first place. Uh, and Camille, we touched upon that earlier as well, right? We were sort of talking about, um, you know, hedge funds and, and private equity funds that are going to be exiting some of these what perceived uh, highly polluting sectors and uh, sort of, if you like, greenwashing themselves. But then it's going to be less... Uh, self-regulatory types of people buying into these assets and then actually working them even harder up until the point of their uh, life cycle or end life cycle. Have you got a further comment to make on that, Camille? How can we sort of engage the audience to understand what that is all about? So I, I think the, the point that Bo is making is, uh, is I mean, you were saying it's a personal, it's a personal comment. I think it's a comment that a lot of people share, which is, hey, you need to at some point, if you're talking addressing something, the magnitude of climate change, it cannot be about governments giving subsidies and picking and choosing what's with the right people and the wrong people on the market or what's the right technology and the wrong technology. Um, I'm an economist by training, so I started my career in emissions trading back in the early 2000s when Europe was launching um, the first large scale emission trading scheme, which aim was really to give a price to carbon. And I really think one of the things that I, I think would be instrumental in driving green growth in an effective way is by finding a way, be it between private organization, be it government to government, be it at the level of the European Union, but to give a price of carbon 
which basically would be an incentive to bait CO2 where it's the most economically efficient. And in my view, that will really be an incentive for people that have more advanced technology versus people that have less advanced technology in terms of environmental standards and to differentiate and to levelize them. Because if you have a price of carbon, if you take a power plant, which is more efficient, it will be cheaper for them to generate electricity uh, versus someone that has higher emission standards. Same things obviously applies to cars, to aviation, to a lot of different sectors. So I'm really, really hopeful that as as really the the government's focus is is moving towards uh, addressing climate change, that talks about carbon pricing uh, will 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 take shape and, and move forward. Because I think this is really a way to ensure that foreign direct investments, but private money, is really going to places where the cost of abating carbon is the most effective. No, I mean, the carbon pricing is so crucial, right? I mean, you kind of need that global uh, uh, measure in order for everything to flow from it, you know, regardless of what level you're at. In some ways, you know, having sat in some of the more recent APEC uh, transportation working groups, what was fun, what was really, uh, you, well, what was really eye opening was the fact that there's so many different countries at different levels of progression. Um, regardless of the topic, whether it was the drones and all these future of transportation, you know, the North American countries and Japan and Taiwan were so much more uh, progressive. And then you come to Southeast Asia, they hadn't even started yet. And I think, Bo, coming back to your um, uh, sector in particular, right now you're seeing uh, those countries for many years, like Vietnam, you mentioned the Philippines, where you have a position. Is there any other countries that you see, even if it's just a personal viewpoint, um, looking to attract uh, inward investment in your sector in particular? I think, again, from the customer standpoint, India is the next opportunity. And, and I've been dealing in India since 1979, and it has always been the country of tomorrow. But if I look at all of our European, North American, and Asian customers, their priority is India. And anything in particular? I mean, when you say, I mean, India is a big country. Where is there a particular area of India that's going to be the focus point? Do you see? No, I would say it's India. Okay. <laughs> so um, let's uh, let's move. I mean, while I've got everybody's attention out there, if you would like to ask any questions of our panelists, then still start putting them into the chat, or if you'd like to uh, raise your hand and have your uh, uh, microphone or camera unmuted, then let me know. Uh, this is the time now to uh, ask the panelists. But uh, we'll continue the conversation in the meantime. And I just wanted to touch a little bit on um, the Asian governments. I mean, we've talked uh, quite a bit actually already about what we would like to see them in terms of carbon pricing and things like that. But Camille, coming back to you, I mean, obviously in the power generation side, would carbon credits per se, as in like a carbon tax credit, uh, similar to what has been uh, used in California, even though it's a temporary measure, it's not necessarily set in stone. Are these benchmarks that could be adopted by Asian nations or does it come back to that affordability where governments just don't have any money after this COVID crisis to be offering sectors incentives I right now? Uh, it's it's going to be very very interesting to 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 think about how how COVID will will impact the energy transition and the pace of the energy transition. But if you're coming back to that sort of triangle of saying environment affordability and energy security, very clearly, if you coming back to the discussion we had earlier on supply chain, I think energy supply is going to become probably higher in terms of in terms of priority and energy security that comes that comes with it. Um, so as government will be defining policies moving forward, they will have to manage uh, the, the topic of energy security, making sure that you can have uh, energy supply that do not depend on too much on other countries. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I live in a country that is Singapore, which has put energy security as one of his very, very clear priorities, and they're developing um, on the large scale LNG as a way to ensure they have uh, stable and diversified energy sources. So I think energy security is going to be very, very key. But the topic of affordability, 
I think will probably take a higher uh, a higher stance moving forward. We've seen interesting announcements from the government in the Philippines, which has been looking at developing nuclear power plants. So nuclear power plants on the large scale is relatively economic. It provides reliable and affordable electricity in the long terms in terms of whatever. So we're seeing governments saying, hey, we of course will continue in terms of the energy transition and push renewables. And I I I really believe this is going to continue to be high on government's agenda, particularly in ASEAN. But I do see other government sort of waiting in the energy security and the affordability topic a little bit higher uh, and making sure that they will have an energy system that enables their economy to grow and more importantly to, uh, to recover. So, uh Bo, coming to you again, I just wanted to talk a little bit, shift gear a little bit towards the end here about people, human factor, um, and a little bit about, you know, obviously we've seen a lot of talk about automation in the supply chain and, and production process. How is that affecting uh, your own business? With You mentioned you've got, you know, several hundred thousand employees that you've had to look after during COVID. Um, what are the challenges ahead you see in that transition of uh you know, the way people work? Well, first, we, we took a very, very hard stand already in February and, and put in very strict rules. Secondly, in most of the countries we are, we are a very large employer, and we used the opportunity to reach out to the local governments and work with the local governments and say, we want to be the benchmark. So, so far, I, I'm surprised that our people have been very disciplined we put in a global task force and we meet every Tuesday and Thursday and share best practices. On the other hand, we have been doing everything to, to separate people as much as possible, especially in, in areas like dining areas and in office areas. And I think that we will live with this in one way or another for a very long time. And I'm very pleased with the Yasaki and please globally that we have been taking this extremely serious. And we also say to people, if you feel that you're not feeling well, don't come to work. Yeah. But, okay, so and then, but looking ahead, has COVID crystallized some of your, stra- you know, longer-term strategies to actually bring it forward in terms of a transition to a more automated, or you already have a heavily automated process uh, inside your organization and there's a question also coming through can we touch a little bit on ai artificial intelligence i was i was going to mention to uh, camille as well but i'll let both finish first is we talked about it offline right now steam and nuclear i mean there's still a lot of what we call manual part uh isn't it in the coal industry in particular so uh maybe both first want to answer that in terms of has anything been brought forward strategically yet that uh you prefer you were putting it off, but now you're going to just go ahead because it seems the right time to do it. I mean, first, we, we do many different type of parts. So if you take connection systems and terminals are very automated. One of our plants can make one billion terminals a month. So wow. we have been speeding that up. Secondly, the, the large wiring harness or electric distribution system in the vehicle if you drive a BMW 7 Series, it's very large. So it's like 100 pounds. It's very manual. But clearly here we have been speeding up everything we can, and especially we are speeding up the controls. So much more use of cameras, much more use of sensors, and we are speeding it up. I think another interesting thing from our end customers, three years ago everyone was talking about car sharing, and the sales of cars would go down. Now it's totally opposite because everyone wants to have a private space. So free trends I see as much more automation, much more use of artificial intelligence, and people again would like to have their own car. Yeah, that's an interesting point because we were, again, discussing in APEC was uh, how do we get trusted travel back to the public uh, travel sector? So that's an interesting point that you raise about the demand going up for private space in private cars. We're seeing it also in private aviation, uh, increased demand again for 
private aviation at the top end. Uh, Camille, why, why don't you uh, comment, you know, in the last five minutes, sort of just talk about from a G perspective, obviously large workforce. What are the challenges ahead? Is it, is it the retraining part or, um, you know, with all these new technologies coming in, the automation is speeding up? What are you seeing? So for, for, for DE, you're obviously at the, at the forefront of, of automation, both uh, for customers and within our products. So if I'm, I'm talking about my own, my own products, obviously we're, we're bringing in uh, digital to enable a better customer experience or they run their power plants, but also to optimize fuel consumption, energy efficiency, um, consumption of, of, of various, uh, various consumables. So we're seeing a lot of uh, technologies and progress here, even if our, uh, our uh, industry is transly relatively slow in adopting uh, new digital tools because of, of, of safety and security concern. But now we're able to bring in really the latest generation combined with cybersecurity to ensure that people will be able to, to have a better a better understanding of controls. When it comes to really the new new technologies and the deployments of new new technologies in uh, in the, the the GE workforce, we very clearly seen an acceleration with with COVID in terms of how people collaborate digitally. Um, if I, if I take the example of, of our business in the region, we operate across fourteen different countries, and. Uh, today, we've been really able to um, to have remote uh, remote startups of power plants with support from a global engineering teams using virtual reality, you, using assisted tools. So, whereas in the past we would have typically thought, "Hey, yes, we'll we'll, we'll do it as a backup," but the the primary mode of deployment will be by sending people from. Malaysia to Indonesia or Indonesia to the Philippines. Now, I guess moving forward, we're going to see a lot more remote operations, remote support where we will bring GE technologies and engineering, but probably by having to put less manpower at site. Obviously, as we sell a large number of spare parts that continue to be, um, I mean, to come, but uh, uh, again, here coming and looking at the supply chain, we're also seeing significant improvements in terms of how we operate supply chain with better digitalization. So very clearly, as you're looking at uh, green growth and AI, I think it really goes together. It will help our products get more efficient, our systems get more efficient, and obviously the way our teams work together be more, more efficient in, in the long term. Okay, well, thanks, guys. I'm going to now uh, just try to summarize some of the points that we've raised today and uh, then conclude the, the webinar. So, uh, Camille, you mentioned, you know, obviously coal remains an important source of power, especially in Asia. Uh, fossil versus renewables in Asia, you know, it's at a deliberate pace that governments are going at in order to keep that, uh, the equilibrium of the triangle you mentioned, the, uh, in, you know, addressing environmental concerns versus the affordability factor in order to keep the economies growing at a pace that's acceptable. And then the reliability factor as well, to keep also the economies running, if you like, uh, as you know, providing electricity all time, where you refer to some of the more advanced economies like California have suffered a few blackouts uh, during the summer period due to uh, adverse environmental weather anomalies. And then, uh, Bo, you mentioned about the importance of localism, in particular for the automotive industry that we're starting to, uh, well, we've seen already for many years, but it's going to probably increase in a post-COVID. Um, and you guys yourself have been in Vietnam since 1995 and continue to see Vietnam as a, a good market for, for your company. But India is, is where you see the next opportunity. And it's always been the tomorrow, the country of tomorrow, but we're hoping that becomes a reality quite soon. And I think there will be an opportunity for India to finally open its borders. Well, I think they'll have to just to get the economy back up and running again. Um, you also mentioned about Toyota's uh, unique part where they allow anybody to use their patents, which I think we didn't really touch upon it. But this this idea of open source in certain sectors of sharing data, the data is a new asset class, right, that we all talk about. And the use of that data without, you know, crossing 
um, personal data restrictions. I think there's data that we can share in an anonymous way for the benefit of a lot of industries to bring forward some of these initiatives in uh, in uh, power concern. So uh, with that, I want to thank my panelists today. Um, we think there will be more remote support going forward. Maybe this is the uh, this is it right here, giving support to the guys who are on the call today. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. It's always never long enough. Uh, thank you, Bo, all the way from Michigan. Enjoy your evening. And Camille, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining me today. And thanks to Harassus for hosting us. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.